Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. We could not do it without you, Dan Crafton, Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and everybody, welcome the brand new patron, Grant! Welcome, Grant! Thanks, Grant! Come on in. On this episode of DTNS, Adobe adds better AI to Photoshop, Meta's Ray-Bans might just be the headset you're looking for, and is Apple done for? I mean, no, but are they? This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, wherever it may be, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. It is a rollicking good Tuesday, my friends. And we are not going to pause, but keep on going through it, starting with the quick hits. Oops, starting with the quick hits. Sonos officially announced its redesigned mobile app will launch May 7th for Android and iOS. Most of the general functions are now on the home screen with some customization options like putting your favorite playlist or the inline audio option at the top. Speaker controls also available in a panel, which you can now access by swiping up from the bottom. Sonos will also retire its apps for Windows and Mac OS, replacing them with a web app that you can use from any internet connected browser, whether it's on your home Wi-Fi or not. Well, that's an advantage. That's nice. Microsoft may be the official partner of OpenAI, but don't forget it also has its own generative models. Phi 3 Mini, that's P-H-I, like Phil. Phi 3 Mini is its newest small mode with 3.8 million parameters. That's how much text it can consider at once. Uh, and they say it's equivalent to GPT 3.5. The advantage to Phi 3 Mini is its size and efficiency. So you get a lot out of it, but it costs less to run. And in some cases, you could even fit it on device. Microsoft says Phi 3 is good for custom applications and accessing internal data sets. I think a lot of companies might be interested in that. Phi 3 Mini is available on Azure, Hugging Face, and Olama, and a slightly larger version, Phi 3 Small, because it's bigger than Mini, uh, and Phi 3 Medium, uh, which I'm going to call Phi Phi 3 Grande, uh, with 14 billion parameters. Uh, Those are both on the way as well. Um, Do you think Phi 3 would be interested in being a part of Animal House? Oh, because it's a, yes, five, yeah, five, 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 uh, five three. You know, yeah. That took me. That took me a half second. That's good. Took, yeah, it took you only a half second. So kudos mm-hmm. to you. Yeah, I <laughs> threw that one at your way. Uh, so Spotify reported record quarterly profit of ninety nine percent per share, ninety nine cents per share, beating expectations of sixty five cents. Yeah, ninety five cents makes more sense than ninety ninety five percent. Monthly active users rose nineteen percent on the year to sixty one point five million just under the 618 million expected so didn't came up short but not by too much the company expects to add 16 million monthly active users next quarter as well the u.s has restricted what kinds of chips can be sold to chinese companies which has motivated those companies to develop their own ways of getting advanced chips uh the long game of course is chinese chip companies making them themselves and then selling them to other companies in the meantime though while they ramp that up some companies have relied on stock they piled up before the restrictions were implemented uh and reuters found that several chinese universities and research institutes were recently able to buy some servers made by dell gigabyte and Supermicro that contained NVIDIA's most advanced chips. Those servers came from 11 Chinese retailers, and we don't know if those retailers themselves stockpiled the servers before the restrictions and then just kind of held on to them, uh, or whether they obtained the servers some other way. Black market. Last week, China required app stores, including Apple's App Store, to stop distributing several messaging apps, Telegram, was one option. Telegram CEO Pavel Durov now says the company hasn't seen a drop in downloads of Telegram in China. Durov suspects it's because you can sideload Telegram on Android. So people use a VPN to get it and sideload. Hmm. He implied this might reduce Apple's customer base in China. Yeah, but you know what would reduce it even more? Not complying with China's order to delist Telegram. Like, that would basically just eliminate it. So there's that. 
Tuesday, Adobe announced that Photoshop will get the ability to generate images from a text prompt in the app. Uh, you could already edit images with a text prompt, but now uh, you'll be able to start from scratch uh, with the generate image feature. You can also use reference images in prompts and then ask the model to match things like style and color. And a new feature called generative fill lets you select a section of an image and tell it to fill it with a generated image. Uh, say, select an empty plate in, in a photo and then give it the text prompt, fill that plate with sardines, and it'll do it. Uh, all generated images are parts of images uh, will include Adobe's content credentials watermark, which will identify it as a generated images. Uh, these features are powered by Adobe's Firefly Image 3 model, which is, of course, improved in all the ways you'd expect, and available in beta now, coming to everyone later this year. If you want to play with Firefly, Firefly Image 3 is available for you to mess around with for free at Adobe's website, but you do have to log in. Uh, I, I created a uh, picture with Adobe Firefly of a person writing a newsletter about Adobe Firefly and put it in my newsletter at techtom.substack.com. You, you know, I'm out. sort of wondering, um, because we're starting to get a, particularly Adobe tools, but people who are familiar with Adobe's, you know, creative suite, fi uh, Photoshop, um, Premiere, um, uh, Illustrator, everything in between, you know, if you are, if you're, if you're good at this, if you're skilled with these tools, you don't necessarily need AI to help you. It's more of like, I want to create something that I don't have a photo of. I can't generate a, a, an image of, you know, like a vector image. Um, and I don't really know where to start. This feels like a tool that is really, really good for those of us who are sort of like, I'm not, I, I'm not a pro, but I, you know, I want to use these tools to my advantage. Well, the, the great thing about integrating AI is it's scalable to whatever the, the end user needs. So if you do need, like, I, I can't draw a penguin, and, and I really need a penguin for this homecoming, you know, flyer that I'm making. And so you just, you know, you, you prompt out, make a cartoon uh, a penguin with glasses and, and a beanie. But if I'm doing a much higher level thing, I just need small elements to put together a larger image. If I, if, if I were to use it, I would use it to, to make uh, simple shapes or, or, or simple pieces that I would layer on top. So I need, I need a texture of like, you know, paper mache because I want to have this whole thing feel like paper mache instead of going through the 12 different steps to get that look using multiple layers in Photoshop, I can just have a texture and then just kind of integrate it. What it is, is it lets you, it automates some of the more tedious stuff that I think people who use Photoshop uh, and, and to a broader extent, a lot of these AI gener or generative AI uh, tools uh, whether you're using a video editing suite or or Photoshop or Illustrator or what what have you, it's it's there to kind of speed things up. So you're not spending a couple of days yeah. generating all these small things. Which is, and I mean, that is always the promise of all of the stuff. Is if you're good at this, this will only make your job easier. It does not replace your job. It does not make you less of an artist. It makes I mean, you more productive. Yeah, right? exactly. It, 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 I, I see the big advantage here is is pretty much what Roger is saying. It, I'm a if I'm not really good at this stuff, I'm probably not using Photoshop. Uh, but if I know enough to use Photoshop, there's a lot of things where I know oh, I'm not going to want to spend the time to do that. But I guess I have to. Uh, and now I can just tell it like make the paper mache, like Roger was saying, and that's going to speed things up and allow me to spend more time using my talents in ways that will make the photo better rather than spending all my energy on the tedious stuff and then running out of energy at the end of the day and going, you know what, this is fine. I don't have time to, I don't have any more time to spend on it. I mean, if, if, if it worked in an automated masking, that would be awesome because that's one of the more tedious things is to, to mask out a layer so you can then cut out, you know, 
pack on additional layers on top. It, of it. does some things that are that are similar to that, like the uh, the the fill color, where you can just kind of you know take the more, or what is it called? It's it's a brush where you can just oh. brush uh, a color across something. And and it'll only put it in that one. I, I know the the, yeah. the yeah. example they use on the website is somebody's sunglasses changing yeah. the tint from well, brown and to I pink. Mean, you know, just for anybody who hasn't played around with these tools a lot, there was a time where you can do that, but you have to precisely, you know, cut out each glasses frame, and you know, you know, there are several layers involved. Again, if you're good at this, you know, muscle memory. If you're not. It is a real barrier to entry. So this kind of stuff allows, you know, those of us who are, you know, uh, artist adjacent uh, to be pretty good artists. And the real artists can, you know, can go ham as they always have. And yeah, I think the one that's that's closest to what you're talking about, Sarah, <clears throat> at the beginning of like, I don't know how many pros really need this is generating the image from scratch, but I suppose Roger's Penguin... Uh, example is, is as good as any, but if you're like, I don't have an image at all and I want to start with something, I, I wonder how many Photoshop pros start there. Like usually somebody's using an image that they, they have captured. Yeah. Um, as reference. And, and yeah. that's where the reference imaging part of this, I think is really powerful of like, I need, I, I, instead of spending a long time describing the blue truck with the yellow trim, I can just say like, yeah, put this truck in this picture and then point at the truck in an image and it'll do it. That's pretty great. I mean, honestly, this is kind of one of the uh, the holy grails of a lot of these creative apps is there's a lot of tedious stuff. If you could just cut, whittle away at that so I can focus on my yeah. broader vision, I, 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 it, I, it's... I I am I, I'm very excited to actually try this out. Yeah, I mean templates went a long way to doing that when templates came around a, a long time ago. This is the next step up. Is is like in some cases you won't even need a template. You, you can you can just use a prompt where you might have had to use a template and it saves you even more time. I know sometimes you're like, well, how much time does it really save you? But it adds up, you know, and and frustration and things going wrong and and all of that. So yeah, this is, I, I do want to give Adobe uh, credit for navigating the the AI tool landscape very well. Most of the ones they have in, introduced seem to work well. They seem appropriate to the task and they've been very careful about copyright. Uh, they embed watermarks on everything so you know that it's AI uh, and they don't use any uh, training uh, that has any kind of copyright question about it. They require you when you're using your reference images to swear that you've got the copyright to it. That's on you. Uh, so I, I think they've done a good job navigating this stuff. This show is full of things that I feel like we would not have even talked about five years ago. Mm hmm. Yeah. AI and continue? Photoshop, definitely not five years ago. <laughs> What's next? Well, when the Ray-Ban Smart uh, Meta Smart Glasses launched last fall, um, not the first iteration, but the latest iteration, that iteration also did not support multimodal AI, which can process multiple types of information like photos or audio or text. Meta said at the time it was coming. Then pretty soon after that offered an early access program for multimodal AI today available to everyone with compatible glasses. So the primary command is, hey, Meta, look and identify a type of animal, read a text on a sign in a different language or something that you don't understand otherwise, write captions for an Instagram post and so on. Each time the glasses take a picture, send the info to the Meta cloud in the sky Answer comes down, arrives in your ears, because they're also earbuds. The Verge's Victoria Song notes that although the glasses identify things correctly sometimes, not all the time, struggled with a type of Italian car. Uh, uh, she and her partner were putting it to the test. Also, certain plants, things that were too far away. The glasses don't have zoom options, so if you're trying to identify, you know, a squirrel versus a musk. Uh, 
Grat or something like that, and it's too far away. <laughs> you know, you can't zoom in. You got to take a photo of a photo, and, and you know, and make I it. I think it was a hedgehog. Yourself. Was it? Was it a hedgehog that? It was a groundhog. A groundhog. A groundhog. Yeah, their yeah. partner they was like, like. There's a huge a squirrel? squirrel. Yeah, <laughs> that was a funny story in Victoria Song's piece. Uh, like yeah, no, too. um, and and really good write up from from Victoria, and, and just you know some of some of the notes that sh- she also said is, you know, it's paired with your phone. Um, that's how it works. So the whole sort of like AI to the cloud back to your answer, pretty snappy. Um, you don't have those sorts of situations with humane AI, for example, which is why so many of the reviewers gave it a, you know, less than stellar score saying it just takes too long, takes too long to process stuff in the cloud and then give me the answer that I'm looking for. Um, the glasses also can be used for live streaming. You can just use them as a camera. You don't have to use them in any AI um, way, but uh, it sounds like we're kind of getting there. There are also sunglasses versus transitional lenses. So, you know, you might have these and wear them only outdoors. If you want to wear them all the time, you'd probably want those transitional lenses, uh, depending on what your needs are, eye-wise, your mileage may Or no vary. sunglasses at all, right? You could just have no, clear lenses. Or yeah. no sunglasses at all, exactly. But I, I feel like we're getting to the point where, when I read this, I was like, and I haven't tried these out, and Tom, I know you have the first gen of these. I was like, okay, we're getting to a point where someone's like, yeah, I mean, it's not great all the time, but it's pretty great some of the time. The smartest thing Meta did was not try to do a display. Uh, that makes it easier for these to look like normal glasses, which they do. Uh, it makes it uh, limited on what it can do, but it can do that very well. So humane, I don't want to give humane AI the excuse of not being paired to the phone because it has a connection built in. It, by all rights, should be faster than pairing with your phone because the connection is built in. So I think it's their cloud servers that are slowing it up, not mm, not the connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that said, Meta's got great cloud servers, uh, obviously, uh, and and decent. Uh, you know, the Llama Two model is is, is a decent model. It does, doesn't work all the time. That's kind of true for AI all the time. Sometimes it hallucinates. Sometimes it confidently tells you the wrong answer uh, to something. And Victoria Song had some examples of that as well. Uh, but I do think that knowing, okay, well, all it can do is talk to me, limits your expectations. And from what I can gather, it may not be good for every single situation. I'd never thought of the Zoom uh, thing that we mentioned, but it's going to be good for a lot of stuff. And I could see, especially traveling, uh, if you're like, wait, where am I? It could probably tell you that uh, with, with a decent uh, level of accuracy. It can translate signs for you. Uh, so I don't know that it's worth $300 for being handy quite yet, uh, but I feel like we're 90% of the way there on making these look like something we wouldn't mind wearing. And we're 50% of the way now on practicality of, of like, Oh, this would actually be helpful. Yeah. I mean, in, in a world uh, where <laughs> uh, many of us are trying to figure out like, can I wear a headset on my face and live my life and things just are better rather than worse? Uh, I don't think we have that answer yet. But if you're wearing sunglasses that can do certain things well, not everything super well, it's not really a computer. It's a, you know, it's a... It's, it's an a accessory. Little, it's an accessory. It's a little friend, a little friend in your pocket. Yeah. That, I think, that that's a huge market for a lot of people who are like, I don't want the whole thing. I just want something that's like kind of cool. I need sunglasses anyway. It's, you know, sunny outside. Mm-hmm. And now I, you know, I have sunglasses plus. Yeah, I... I wonder if we look back on these glasses, sunglasses or not, and just go like, well, that was weird that we tried to put it in there because now we all know that what you want is an implant above your ear or something. Who knows what it's going to be, right? But I I do feel like this is probably a step on the road to the eventual thing, whatever that eventual thing is. Yeah, the the grandparent uh, Gen Z crew is going to say, you know what we used to do? <laughs> we used to have We used to put sunglasses glasses. on and the kids would go, no way. And they're you like, no, not. we did. We didn't we didn't have any other option. You just didn't get new eyeballs implanted? Yeah. No, they're you like, couldn't do that. Cloud, back then. Grandma? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a long story. <laughs> you trusted your data to be somewhere else? <laughs> wow. Well, you didn't have mesh networks? What's wrong with you people? 
Uh, well, folks, if you've got ideas or maybe you're from the future and would like to tip us off on what's going to happen, you can send those to us on social networks. Uh, we're all over the place at DTNS show on X and Mastodon. That's uh, at DTNS show mstdn.social, uh, Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks, DTNS P-I-X, on Instagram and on threads. Here's the good news. Apple has an announcement set for 10 a.m. Eastern Time, May 7th, three hours earlier than usual. I had to look three places to make sure it wasn't just like somebody getting the time zone wrong. Uh, they usually do 10 a.m. Pacific. They're doing 7 a.m. Pacific. Uh, they have a drawing of the Apple Pencil uh, in someone's hand on the invite. So this is definitely about iPads. Uh, not a surprise announcement by the looks of it, which is fine, except... Apple doesn't have a lot of good news otherwise at the moment. According to CounterPoint Research, Apple's market share fell 19.1% on the year last quarter, the biggest drop of any smartphone maker in China. And in a market that overall grew 1.5%, China grew 1.5%. It's not falling anymore. You can't say, as I have said before, well, Apple's suffering the same economic problems as everybody else. They're not. Uh, then there's Mark Gurman's report on Monday that interest in the Apple Vision Pro has dipped. Gurman's stuff was mostly anecdotal, people not showing up for demos, uh, some of the stores saying they've dropped to only selling a couple of Vision Pros a week. But there's more concrete numbers coming from analyst Ming-Chi Kuo. And I always pair Gurman and Kuo up in my head as the two reliable analysts on this stuff. Kuo said Tuesday that Apple has lowered its expected shipping number of Vision Pros for 2024. Now, some people say, well, this was the original number and then they raised it and now they're having to lower it back. But they're having to lower it back. And Kuo also says that they may not release a new version of the Vision Pro in 2025. Previously, everyone expected them to start doing, you know, a new model every year or so. That might not happen now. Sarah, there's been a constant drumbeat the entire time both of us have covered technology that Apple's done for, and, and from before. Basically, since Apple began, there's been that drumbeat of, this is it, Apple can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. This time, I'm not saying Apple's done for, to be honest, but is Apple losing momentum i think so i i think so and i also say this as you know i never try to be an apple apologist but i am an enthusiast and you know looking at those china numbers um it is not insignificant that apple's uh share of the smartphone market dropped just under 20 percent that's yeah. big at the same time, Huawei rose something like 65%. So, you know, this is a country that <laughs> is just enjoying more options. Um, at the same time, at a price point uh, for Apple, and, you know, Apple kind of being, you know, the cool kid in the group in certain markets, um, now enjoying some more competition. Um, enjoying is a nice term for this. But um, going to the vision pro uh side of you know our conversation and eileen and i were talking about this yesterday on apple vision show um i struggle um and i've i've got a vision pro i mean it's it's right there <laughs> i don't have it on my person at this point but um it, you know i i i i i'm trying to constantly figure out like what what is this good for for me I know what it can do. I know what it's supposed to be capable of. But what is it good for for me? And I consider myself to be a person that's, you know, finger on the pulse of tech more than the average person. And I struggle to do that. I think media consumption, great. But I have other options. I have a television in my living room, you know? Like, do, do I ever think like I have to use the Vision Pro to watch something rather than something in my living room? No, not at this time. If some, you know, I, I don't know, someone was having a party in my living room and I wanted to like go into a closet and watch a movie, I guess I could. But, you know, again, I'm solving, uh, you know, I'm making solutions to problems that aren't really there. Yeah, you haven't and had think, those, those parties at your house yet. That's what, <laughs> yeah, right. And don't come, everybody, okay, until Friday when I have pizza. But um, I think that that... That is the Vision Pro problem is it's trying to solve a problem that a lot of people don't feel like they have. It's like, yeah. let's imagine the workspace. People are like, well, I have one. So is this cooler? Huh. It's kind of cool, but it's kind of cumbersome. So we're like, it's like right above the, you know, right above that, you know, that hill 
that, um, you know, I, I think Apple will be remembered fondly for this. Are they going to have another Vision Pro in 2025, et cetera, et cetera, you know, on some sort of an iPhone timeline? I would be very surprised if that were true. Well, well th this is the problem. I, I, I try very hard and I have the entire run of this show and the two shows that I did similar to it previously before to counter every notion that uh, this seemingly bad news is worse than it appears. Uh, so... With Apple Vision not shipping in as high a numbers, uh, I I might and and I would be willing to say like okay, but that doesn't mean it's a failed product. Down the road, uh, you might f find it bounces back. The Apple Watch wasn't as big of a hit out of the gate as it is now. Uh, you might say okay, but they don't have another star product, and it's like well, they will eventually. Maybe the Apple Vision Show just needs some more time. Uh, Pro. <laughs> uh, sorry, the, the Apple Vision Show you should subscribe to right now. The Apple I mean, Vision Pro pretty needs, great, needs Tom. some more time. Gotta yeah. be honest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so what are they going to do in the meantime? Well, they're going to sell iPhones with the strategy. Then, OK, let's look at the strategy for selling iPhones. The strategy for iPhones is they've reached market maturity in a lot of places. And China was their big growth opportunity. And they're now going the opposite direction that they need to for lots of reasons that are outside of Apple's control. There's patriotism towards Huawei because of, of U.S. restrictions. Uh, there's just a general economic malaise that does provide headwinds even though more companies in China are moving against those headwinds than Apple is right now. Uh, and then you say, okay, well, if China is going to be a problem, they need to grow somewhere else. Where is that? And that is a big question that Apple has not addressed. Could be, should be India, could be African countries like Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, but you're going to need a lower price point for that. And you started to see the think pieces this week that were saying Apple needs to have a bargain iPhone for emerging markets. Uh, my point being, for each one of these, there's an answer. But this is the most number of questions I've seen at once with Apple with few bright spots. And the big announcement that's coming in May is for iPads that we've been waiting two years for. And it's like an OLED iPad, like nothing wrong with that. But that's that's not the big thing that goes, oh, yeah, OK, it's not, it's you know, not restoring our faith. Any sort of wheel. Yeah, exactly. So I'm not saying Apple's done for far from it. Uh, but I am saying for the first time in a long time, I'm not seeing the good news. I'm not seeing the obvious thing that I can say, ah, but you're forgetting about X. Uh, they they are in a lull, is what I would say. They, they've hit a calm spot in the waters. Well, and, you know, the people, some people, not all people, but some people put Apple on a pedestal like, they can't do any wrong, you know. They're the best at this. They're the best at that. Who even cares that they're first? They're the best. Um, and those people are the ones who are sort of like, oh, no. You know, is Apple just not going to, you know, be like, you know, the largest company in the world after every quarterly earnings? It's like, no. And a lot of really great companies also aren't. You know, let, let's bring it down a notch. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. the people who work at Apple aren't like wizards that are more Yahoo capable still than exists. the rest of us. Apple yeah. will be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's not the best time for Apple, but certainly not the worst, right? Yeah. Yeah. If Shoot you, your if shot. You look back Apple. on the nineties folks. They've had it worse. All right. <laughs> Let's check out the mailbag. Uh, this one comes in from Andre. Andre says, when I first started using Facebook, I loved it. Then it morphed into a love-hate relationship. Now I only have Facebook for Messenger. I rarely use that either. I only download Instagram on the weekends. At this point, social media is like a controlled substance in my life. It's super addictive, potentially harmful. The value I get from it isn't worth the time I waste on it. Oh, man, Andre, I kind of feel the same way. I kind of feel the same way, too. But, Andre, if I'm understanding this correctly, do you uninstall and then reinstall Instagram so that you have it on the weekend? If so, you're going a little further than I am. I, I like to ignore it, but I never really uninstall anything that I feel like I'm using too much. I Either way, uh, I think calling it a controlled substance is perfect. Uh, 
I feel like social networks for me are more like booze than they are the cocaine. <laughs> Your mileage may vary, uh, which is like, a little bit's fine for most people. There are some people that shouldn't have any of it, you know, uh, but none of us should have too much social network. And and it's good to know your limits. I was about to be like cocaine, alcohol, but I'm like, yeah, actually, that makes sense. You know, yeah. some people just, you know, it's not crazy. Other people can't have it at all. So. Uh, we got another great, uh, very sweet email from Daniel in Cincinnati, uh, who said, 35 years ago, my brother had just graduated from college with a computer science degree. My mother worked at the customer service counter at a local grocery store, and she griped to my brother, every three years, they upgrade the computer systems in the office, and every upgrade, our computer system gets worse. When you're programming, remember, I'm the one that has to use it. Uh, and Daniel is is citing this very sweet story uh, to note that a customer is somebody who pays for a product, but they may not ever touch it. The actual user may not have been involved in the purchase decision at all. They just have to use whatever they're given. So I think the term user is fine and, in fact, welcome. While creating a product, one has to remember how people are going to use it. Will people be frustrated by an experience or will they not even notice how easy it is? By calling people users, it keeps those questions front and center. Developers should end up with a better product by smoothing out complex promise processes. Thanks, Mom. I always think of her frustrations and how she would use a product or program designed for the user and let the marketing team sell to the paying customer. Oh, Daniel, this was great. You know, this we had this conversation about is user, you know, derogatory? You know, do we need uh, other uh, uh, terms for somebody who is using, um, you know, a hardware or software product or some combination of both? And yeah, I think... I think Daniel's mom might say, you know, I, I didn't buy this, but I have to use it. I'm a user. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, it's a good argument. I still find user a little weird. Maybe there's another term. Maybe there's not, though. This is, this is a, a very persuasive story, and uh, and I, I thank you for sending it, Daniel. Also, instant feedback. Nate Langson uh, is in the uh, audience uh, listening and wrote, I quit drinking five years ago because I didn't like the person it made me. I quit social media mostly because I didn't like the way it made other people. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, that is a very pertinent observation. Thank yep, you, Nate. Yep, yep. I mean, how many how many friends do you have IRL where you're like, you're great. Social media, don't like no. you at all. Yeah, no. I've I'm not going to say it to their face, myself. but yeah. I have more than a few. Well, patrons, uh, stick around for the extended show. We're not done with the fun conversations yet. Good Day Internet is the second half of the show. And if you've been thinking CAPTCHAs, you know, the puzzles you have to identify bridges and stoplights in order to complete your login. If you think CAPTCHAs are getting harder, you're right. Wall Street oh, Journal has a whole article about it. Stick around. Great. It can't wait. Just a reminder, you can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow discussing meta licensing its BROS to others. With Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other. Understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>